everybody. Om Aguru Vajadara Vakindra Bhattaraka Sumati Jnana Shasana Dara Samudra Sri Padal Sarva Siddhi Hum Hum Pe. That's my new way of beginning. The mantra of my teacher, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, taking refuge in him. And he representing the three jewels of Buddha Dharma Sangha, which are, which are the teacher, the coach of reality, the teacher of reality, the coach of how we can come to counter reality ourselves, reality itself and the teaching of that reality, and the community of those seeking to know reality, our friends, the scientists, either materialist or spiritual, either Western or Eastern, and there are friends, all the spiritual people who are not dogmatic and fanatical about their ism, but they are inclusivists about it, who cede to the divine the ability to have more than one dogma and more than one teaching. All of those are in the Sangha. Okay, so that's my begin new beginning of these readings. Living mindfully in the face of death, in living the evolutionary life in the light of inevitable death. I gotta stop chanting, sorry. <laughs> in living that in the light of inevitable death of any particular body that we are inhabiting, and, uh, and uh, having this kind of roadmap of the death process, and wishing to prepare to be able to undergo it with some degree of lucidity, are very helpful in what we're trying to do while living, which is to live more lucidly. That is to say, to be more alive in the moment in what's actually happening by being really more open-minded and realizing that every moment is fresh and new and therefore observing it more carefully to see its beauty and its, its problems and, and even to find a half full even in the problems. That's how we want to live and living in the face of death and by knowing that by again and again becoming more and more familiar with that, realizing the impermanence of everything, going from coarse impermanence, which is being certain that we will die in some future time, we always think, to realizing things are dying and being reborn all the time, every minute, every second, which is called subtle impermanence, really living in a vibration of constant change. In other words, openness, open-mindedly in the, in the realm of constant change, then that's very lucid about being more lucid about being alive and lucidly awake. So you have lucid dreaming, you have lucid dying, and you have lucid waking, which is what, the, what we want to do, right? You can come to see your living process and your contemplative journeys, which you embark upon to discover your more subtle inner dimensions as a between state or bardo, which you have the, this, and this is the bardo, this is the life bardo, that's what we're in. To, when you're living life as being in the life bardo, you are not in cyclic life. Because you're in, but well, you in a little bit maybe, but you're only subtly in cyclic life, because you're in between and you're not driven in the same way. Because you're in that sort of time when 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 there's optimal quantum jumpability, you're not stuck in this very solid type of form. You're in a mental form, like in a dream, where the, you can change embodiment very dramatically in a dream because it's subtle. <coughs> like that marvelous teaching of the bardo known as the matrix where Neo because he was in that subtle form he could magnify himself he could be a hundred Neos which he did when fighting with the bad guys when they, they, they picked up on his vibe and they learned how to magnify themselves the agents remember so that's living in, living in the bardo at an extreme level because he was the one but everyone is the one is what that teaches actually so your dream states are, you can begin to live more holistically in the six betweens uh, that, that, that there are, you know. The death between is only one out of six. There are three death betweens and three life betweens, in other words. So the, the ones we know about, that we think about, is, is the, the death one is divided in three, which is the death point between, which is where you kind of immediately blast out into... Actually, you go through the eight levels. Immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, immeasurable equanimity, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, seeming nothingness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. That's what you go through, actually. You go through those and the death point. And that's why often you get stuck in the unconscious one, 
when you're not prepared for it. And you don't quite hit the super subtle one of being consciously unconscious, really. Uh, you, you swoop past it. And you don't even see the gradations of how you hit that because you're so flipped out, because you're sort of thrown right to the depth of it instantly when you're sort of no longer in, 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 enthroned in a heart chakra. Because that's when your subtle mind body, your super subtle energy mind body, leaves the subtle mind body of the central nervous system where it has been residing, especially in the heart chakra. Of course, it's everywhere in a way, but it's also mainly in the heart chakra. And it shoots up or down or sideways or any way or any way it goes out. Or if your body is blown up in a nuclear pulverizing explosion, then it just immediately goes out because there's no physical thing to be embodied in in its space immediately. But then it immediately can be completely outside any blast range because its, so, its subtle body will not be touched by that which is a blast force only of the course. And the subtle, never the super subtle. You can't touch super subtle. Clear light. It is clear light, actually. Okay, so clear light pressed into a very over intense sense of differentiation of, by hatred. That's what it is chain reaction. Uh, so I'm sorry, but oh, yeah. So, yeah, lucid, lucidly in six betweens, yes. Awakening or enlightenment, oh yeah, the six betweens is what I was doing, I'm sorry. So, the, the, they are the death point between, there's what's called the reality between, where your subtle body-mind goes into different dreamlike realities of pure lands and Buddha lands and Buddha presences and things like that. What's called the Dharma Datu, the reality realm, you go into that, so it's the reality between. And the Procreation between what I what I was translating here, still and in my own translation of the Book of the Dead, the existence or emergence between. Some people used to translate the becoming between, but what I like to call it now is the procreation between. It is the word bhava, which means to make to come into being or to be something. So that sense, existence is not wrong, emergence is not wrong because bhava it's some bhava. Uh, part of, uh, pro, prabhava can be like that emergence, but it, but procreation is the best between up to the brink of being conceived in another life. Awakening or enlightenment in this con so oh, that's the three death betweens. But then there is when you do awaken in another life, you have the waking life between, you have the dream between. So the waking life between is being is between conception and death point. So the conception point and the death point is the waking life between. Unfortunate abortion freak out people are right in the sense that the person is there from conception, but they're wrong to make it politically forced on people who don't know that and to put women into a horrible situation, therefore. And they're, they're according to the compassionate one, they are wrong to do that. But they are right, there is a person there. And in Japan, for example, where they, where abortion became a, the the birth control of choice because the Japanese males would wear rubbers, and so forth, then uh, the women have this whole cult of Shitigarba, the great Bodhisattva, asking him to put them in another womb, put their new child in another womb, somewhere where they they have the, the means to take care of that child, because it's harmful to bring a child when you can't take care of it. That's also that's a, another kind of violence, actually. So those pro-lifer quote people should be they have to deal with the whole life, not just the conception moment. According that's why it's wrong to legislate it and force people. Treat women like cows or something. It's wrong. Even though there is a taking of a life is separated from a body at that point. So, so, so there's a life between the dream between, which is between waking and sleeping, or sleeping and waking and reawakening, and the contemplation between, which is between setting yourself to contemplate in whatever type you are, either withdrawing from your senses because you are, um, and withdrawing even from your mental sense, and which is imagination, you're withdrawing from those to try to develop calm and one pointedness and concentration or the type of between where you're using your imagination or you're analyzing things 
with your discursive powers and you're not withdrawing from them actually but you're you're shaping reshaping them reshaping your perception of them through either imagination or analysis imagining them and analyzing them so there those are the two those are the contemplation between so you have three life betweens and interestingly the dream between connects in the death three death betweens to the death point between and the procreation between um, creates to the contemplation between because in the contemplation between you are, um, or vice versa. No, you, well, you could do it another way. Okay, never mind that. I was a speculation, but I, I later, in some future work, I will try to unpack that. Up to the brink of being conceived in another life. Okay, awakening or enlightenment in this context is to undergo all of them consciously, lucidly, with mindful awareness, lucidly dreaming, lucidly journeying in contemplations, and of course being lucidly self-directing during the dying and post-death betweens. And that's what Buddhahood is. So Buddhahood is not being isolated in one state or another. Buddhahood is having all of them accessible to you simultaneously at all times. And so that enables you to sort of jump frequencies, so to speak, so that you can therefore, it's like a morphic resonance chanting, you know, the Tibetans can do that, you know, and uh, some Siberians and things. Oh, 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 where you can consciously make a deep rumbling baritone sound and a high tenor sound. And even in between sounds, you can create many by having, by resonating other frequencies within your vocal cords, you know. And so a Buddha has done that kind of thing to the extreme, where they have, they can resonate at all, in all planes simultaneously, limitlessly and simultaneously. By definition, they have become... They are kind of AI human, <laughs> or AI deity, or AI whatever. Buddhas can be animal. They can take animal form, any form. They can go into hell, and bring to bring beings out. They will. So it's to undergo all of them consciously, lucidly, with mindful awareness, lucidly dreaming, lucidly journeying and contemplations, and of course, being lucidly self-directing during the dying and post-death betweens. And this is how we can train in our lives. It doesn't take long. We could be already elderly, and we could learn to do. Uh, we could go to Bardo School, which we are trying to found, and we could do to go to Bardo University. We go to the Bardo Department of a University, not to sort of put electrodes on people and see what they're doing in the Bardo, but to ourselves go visit there, and to become lucid dreamers and so forth. Lucid dreaming school. This should be in curriculums. People to become psychonauts in the university, definitely, and be aware of that and aim for that from high school, and even be aware of it as something normal that they are honored in society, psychonauts, in grade school. <laughs> and uh, that should be the case. Become lucidly self-directing, even during waking, between, during dreaming, between, during contemplation, between while alive, and then death being used as a quantum evolutionary jumping place to jump to ever better and better embodiments. For anyone who wants to wake up, there is a great opportunity in this dying process to practice the letting go or giving away of self process and to experience the clear light transparency state as a stage of liberation. One becomes free to be all that is, all that as blissful peace, while also effortlessly navigating specific responses from the super subtle body mind continuum to the stressed feelings of other beings who are struggling. This is the time when samadhi meditation as the empowering force of concentration becomes utterly indispensable. This is where samadhi helps you drill your way to the inconceivable release of Buddhahood while not abandoning all the relational beings your innate selfless super bliss allows you to love without reservation. Some might now think of this amazing inner science approach to the dying and rebirthing process as somehow a tantric intrusion developed and refined in Tibet. It is true that the great Tibetan inner scientists, scholars, sage, yogis, and yoginis preserved and hugely developed the study, practice, and achievement of Buddha and his Indian successors, teachings, and scientific studies of the tantras. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that this analysis of the death process is drawn from the Indian inner science of Buddha and his enlightened successors. Take a look at the eight stages 
And let, and let Buddha, nowadays I would include Buddha Patanjali, Buddha Padarayana, Buddha Gautama, another Gautama, all kinds of, of different Buddhas, not only Shakyamuni Buddha. And in, in, in that great time of the Indian mind science revolution 2,500 years ago, and his enlightened success, and their enlightened successors, Take a look at the eight stages of dissolution and the eight course mentality contemplative states taught in the Pali and Sanskrit early sources to put them side by side in another table. <clears throat> the earth to water, fire. Oh, yeah, this is the same table I did before, so I don't need to take it length. But here I'm adding, when I had it on page, uh, when I had it on page, uh, here I had only the inner experience and the dissolution of the of the um, uh, uh, eight bardo states and the eight inner experiences, dissolution process of the eight yogic states and the inner dissolution process of the eight um, bardo states. And here what only I added the inner sign, and uh, I called the, the eight states of meditation the contemplative state. That's all. But otherwise, it's the same chart. And mirage, smoky state, fire, fine, swirling state, candle flame, moonlit sky, sunlit sky, pitch darkness, and twilight sky uh, for clear light. Now that I have that more clearly in clear light, I was happy. The reason I like this comparison so much and had a really strong eureka feeling when I first noticed it is that it proves to me Buddha's honesty when he said to his individual vehicle disciples, that's what I always call Hinayana, which I don't like because it says lesser. But it only means just lesser in scope. It's like a different focus. You know, have a lesser focus when you're magnifying some part, and you have a bigger focus when you're taking in the whole thing, and then have a really bigger focus when you're taking in all the subtle dimension. But microscopic combined with microscopic. So it's only lesser in that sense. It's not lesser in terms of inferior at all. It's foundational. Okay? But if someone gets stuck on it and dogmatic about it and refuse that there is the other levels of focus, then then they are actually depriving themselves. So in that sense, Hina, they are deprived. And, and that's to, they shouldn't do that. So the reason, and they don't actually, when they get more developed in it. But some, you know, when you get isms, and then you get institutions, and you have this church, and that dogma, and then they get like that, institutionally, you know. But the reason I like this comparison so much, and had such a eureka feeling, when I first noticed it, is that it proves to me his honesty, that's right. When he said to his individual vehicles, disciples, so the individual and universal is fine, because in, there are universal means all the individuals. So individual is foundational to the universal. So that's not, that's not uh, derogatory, in other words, unless the person gets stuck on it. The disciples, the individual disciples, that he had not withheld any teaching from them, he picked up, so, uh, so he said, first of all, I have no closed fist of a bad teacher, which a bad teacher means someone who knows more than they're willing to share with their disciple, but they keep it back so they can have some leverage over the disciple. You know, they get more pay, get more fun, get more offering, get more respect, or whatever it is they want, domineer the disciple by withholding something from them. That's called acharya mushti, the bad, the closed fist of a bad teacher. So he says, I don't have that. But then he picks up a handful of leaves and shows them in his hand and says words to the effect that I have held nothing back in the closed fist of a bad teacher. Though, of course, there are also as many teachings in the Buddha verse as there are leaves out there in the forest. And when he was teaching, it wasn't deforested in India. And there are plenty of trees around. So there were countless leaves in the sight of any disciple when he would taught that, for sure. So he meant there's more in heaven and earth than you're dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio, even though I've given you everything without withholding anything as suitable to you. And, and, and I'm not explaining in, in there to make it show you my context, is I am clairvoyant about how much you can take. <laughs> he didn't say that. No. Therefore, in one tantric text, Buddha says, everything I've said is a lie, meaning that I've always adapted it to a particular context that fits someone 
truthfully and for them, but if taken as a dogma universally, it is not correct in some other context. So it has a, it, it has a lying aspect to it. And I know that, that others will misunderstand, misinterpret it, but it still helps this one, so I will say that in this context. That's the key to his interactivity as a teacher. In inner science cosmology, he was teaching that they had the states of form and formless realms within their experiential reach, and they would experience them any way every time they died or even fell asleep. And he was even hinting that they had the Buddha nature already within themselves, an awakening or complete Buddha all-knowing awareness already there within, just covered over by a shell of misknowing. And that makes sense about clear light. Because clear light is this infinite energy, which includes, therefore, infinite awareness of itself. It's non-dual awareness, so therefore that means subjectivity and objectivity as non-dually together. So it's both consciousness and matter, and, obje and objective and innate matter, and in unconsciousness together, actually. Imagine Shakyamuni Buddha thus taught the bardo between state teachings in his earliest contemplative cosmos inner science teachings, and we are all still trying to catch up with them 2,500 years later. Now under the heading Supernormal Awareness and Powers, speaking of catching up with Buddha, in visiting this amazing samadhi branch of completing the supereducation in mind, you have to consider the subject of the supernormal, I never say supernatural, and please let's not use it, as these are all quite natural, Superknowledges or superknowings, abhijna, abhijna, and superpowers, which include teleportation and telekinetic powers, clairvoyance, clairaudience, former life remembrance, telepathy, and knowledge of the termination of contaminants, and even future life knowledge, or we can say nirvanic reflexive awareness. <clears throat> That's what is included in the supernormal or superknowledges, superknowings. The inner science says that these superknowings are natural, the mundane five automatically attainable at the fourth immensity of one-pointed equanimity, and the sixth superknowledge, except for anybody who, who gets deceived, who gets into one-pointed equanimity somehow, without being aware or allowing awareness in themselves of relativity, of the royal reason of relativity, of some lovingness and interconnectedness, and then becomes deceived into seeking rebirth as a formless realm deity, and thereby getting stuck in that psychosis, a divine psychosis of thousands of millennia, and so on. That's the exception of that. Otherwise, these, they won't have that because they'll just shut themselves down in subtle unconsciousness. They may never get beyond, such a person, however, may never get beyond the nothingness, seventh state. They may never reach the eighth state, let me say. But who, who knows? Finally, of course, none of these descriptions are dogmas. So somebody may discover other things about them in the future. When all our scientists bring their open-mindedness more deeply to this, and it becomes global inner science instead of just Indian inner science, and it becomes Indian inner science and just Buddhist inner Tibetan inner science, when it becomes global and every individuals, creativity, African inner science it becomes, North American, South American, Polynesian, <laughs> indigenous, then they might find new things about all these things. Because any verbal description of anything cannot capture the inconceivable beauty and goodness of everything. The inner science says that these super are natural, the mundane five automatically attainable at the fourth immensity of one-pointed equanimity, and the sixth super knowledge attainable with the attainment of partial nirvana of sainthood, arhatship, or total nirvana at Buddhahood. The mundane five are said to pose the danger of causing distraction on the way to full awakening, but are considered useful, even indispensable, for an awakened bodhisattva or Buddha to make her or his teaching more effective in helping others. I am still hoping that will be the case, since I don't have that. If all this inner science cosmology and even eschatology seems overwhelming, 
It should be noted that the ultimate supersubtle reality pervades all relative reality. All theories are only useful hypotheses guiding further experience and experiment, and there is no ultimate dogmatically absolute theory of everything. Except that. Except that there is none. There is none. <laughs> the universe is neither only matter or only mind, and so considering it reductively one way or another is just a way of guiding experience to realize its mind-matter non-dual inconceivable reality. Therefore, the inner science is delighted to honor and utilize in study and implementation the amazing discoveries of the Western outer materialistic sciences through the exploration of the macro and microcosmos, galaxies and universes, as well as cells, molecules, DNA, RNA, atoms, subatomic quanta, and subparticulate energies, inner scientific Buddhas, Buddhists, that's my favorite, Buddhist, not a Buddhist, but a Buddhist, are only asking the outer scientists for the philosophical development and the contemplative achievement of the mental resilience that will enable reciprocity as the inner scientific discoveries are explored by outer scientists in our current pluralistic age. So realistic samadhi is when we bring to life all the other seven facets of the jewel of realism in full liberation, bright awakening, and inconceivable enlightenment itself. Then another heading, intellectual superiority and Buddhism as realism. It's a big thing for me, in speaking to Western Buddhists, to get them to think about learning something. They are so arrogant about their Western English formulating intelligence that they think they have nothing to learn from some ancient culture of a bunch of non-technological people who they think are non-technological, except maybe how to meditate or not overcook vegetables or something. The idea that they might, in some respects, be intellectually inferior to some ancient people, some ancient scientists, is really hard for them to grasp. Really hard. It's difficult for many people to feel intellectually inferior, regardless of their cultural background. Of course, anybody thinks that way. The ego jumps in and reasserts itself. But in the present historical moment, there is something we don't know that we have to learn. Otherwise, the backward, materialistic, consumerist, and militarist culture we have developed is poised to destroy all human life. The Tibetan word nangba, from Sanskrit adhyatmika, literally means insider. For centuries it has been the basic word for a Buddhist. Its most basic definition is someone who has gone inside the three refuges of the jewels of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha which can be thought of as the teacher, the teaching, and the reality taught, and the, in other words, that's the Dharma, both teaching and reality taught, and the society of those seeking that reality. It is like we say in English, you're in the in-group or not. However, Buddhist scholars in India, as well as Tibet, sometimes say that the inside meant by insider refers to an orientation, such as that toward the inner science of the mind, how the mind is bound in egotistical delusion, and how it is liberated through critical wisdom aligned with higher concentration. This is scholarly creativity. So in other words, the mind being more important than the body, the liberation of the mind first, is critical. If you take the three refuges as simply meaning denominational belonging, it doesn't sound that great to be an insider. It definitely is a form of exclusivism. It's like His Holiness the Dalai Lama speaking at Harvard Divinity School Center for the Study of World Religions, telling people that he didn't believe in God, and he wanted them to know it right away, because otherwise they might get to liking him, only to later discover that he didn't believe in God, and at that point they might actually faint. <laughs> so he wanted them to know right off the bat. <laughs> So I was translating that particular discourse, and I kept trying to say it to the bed, and don't tell, you don't have to like spill the beans and freak them out. Come on, come on. In Tibetan, I was muttering, and he just ran right past me, and he just let them know right away, which in fact was really good for them. Maybe a few were totally shocked, but a lot of them thought it was very honest and wonderful. 
Especially because he then said, he admitted that Buddhists had an exclusivist thing, where they thought, unless you know Buddhism, you can't get enlightened. Which he said he had cured by meeting Thomas Merton, and by meeting some great mystics in Spain and Italy as he traveled the world, and feeling there were enlightened himself as much as he could, of course, you know. Uh, he, he wasn't claiming to be a Buddha. He admits to being, trying to be a Bodhisattva, of course, but he didn't, wasn't claiming to be a Buddha. However, if we really think about what the three refuges are, this is kind of important for me, this one, I have in a bracket here, of the three. Of the three, the real refuge is the second, the Dharma. Vasubandhu said that Dharma, the word Dharma, has 11 meanings, the highest of which, well, Dharma has to do, it comes from the verb, I didn't say here, but it comes from the verb dr, which means D-H-R. Dr, they have a different consonant in Sanskrit, of aspirated D, da. So dr, like that. You have to have put an H in there. So uh, you get out of breath right away if you go da, da. <laughs> so it, to hold. And so uh, the idea is reality holds you. It, it, dharma means. So you're held by reality. We're part of reality, right? Yeah. So it has 11 meanings, the highest of which is reality itself. The only truly real reality being nirvana. The relative reality is being slightly less real, luckily. That means that when you take refuge in the Dharma, you are taking refuge in reality itself, which is the only sensible thing to do, because you can't escape reality. reality you, whatever, even if you have an experience of a state of escape, that's been part of reality. You couldn't get there if it wasn't part of reality. Since we have to live in reality. And actually, if we give the Buddha some credit, we can embrace reality with some confidence that it is good. It is Sri Bhadra, glorious goodness. It is safe. It is bliss. It is freedom. It is love and it is compassion. You, you take refuge in the Buddha less directly, not as a person who can save you, since he clearly stated that he could not, but as a, by himself, but as a teacher who pointed out to you after discovering it himself that reality is good, nirvana, freedom from suffering. That he could do like a coach. He could coach you how to know it yourself. You also take refuge in the third of the three, the Sangha, indirectly again, as those who join you in your refuge in the true reality of nirvana, or, or seeking the true reality of nirvana. Taking refuge in reality, of course, is equivalent to being realistic, truly realistic to the bitter end. To repeat what I often say when asked, what is Buddhism? I say, Buddhism is engaged realism. That was the interim title of this book, actually. Buddhism is real. The editor thought that would be a good title. Buddhism, maybe it would be better than this, I don't know. Buddhism is realism. I, was, I didn't like it, only because materialists will think realism means the tabletop, you know. <clears throat> Just this is what I mean. So insider in this case means anyone who does not think that ignorance is bliss, but rather that knowledge, freedom from ignorance, wisdom, these are bliss. That's the thing I have from there. A humanistic scientist, therefore, can qualify as an insider. A theist who thinks that God must be the highest reality, the supreme truth, perhaps an impersonal force of love and creativity, etc., who may disregard culture-specific tenets about tribal male deities with beards and thunderbolts who demand unrealistic blind faith, such a person can be considered an insider. Now there's a heading, the psychonauts, inner science astronauts. Tibetan inner scientists certainly concern themselves much more with the inner universe than the outer one. I have called their adepts psychonauts or mind explorers, mind navigators, in parallel with the heroes of Western science, the astronauts, who explore the stars, the farthest frontiers of the material, material macroverse, 
In other words, that's as far as they can get is the moon, and they are hoping to get to Mars. Or in science fiction, in Avatar, they got to the moon of Jupiter to meet the Navi people by freezing themselves cryogenically for a period of time, which unfortunately we're not able to do materialistically yet. These psychonauts maintained, and they, but that's a pretty arduous way to do it, much better to go in a magic body of super subtle energy that can go much quicker than speed of light. These psychonauts maintain and develop the esoteric tradition, go in warp drive, in other words. But you can't take a piece of coarse metal in warp drive, maybe. Who knows? Psychonauts maintained and developed the esoteric traditions known as Tantra, which constitute the super subtle science and technology of the universal vehicle ad adepts, as their science was quintessentially an inner science, using the human brain and body and the outer body, subtle body of subjectivity as the laboratory. These adepts also developed an inner technology. Then, because they were lucidly awake to life, they were able to, able to lucidly dream, lucidly sleep, lucidly wake, lucidly live, lucidly die, and lucidly create new embodiments. In the between, at full Buddhahood, even multiple embodiments simultaneously. As also Hindus believe that their gods can easily do that. And in a way, Christians do, because although they think that God only had it in him to have the one avatar. But, you know, he had a son, yes, but that was him. Son is partially you. So he also created multiple bodies, they think. The Tibetan view is that these psychonauts are therefore consciously immortal, like true Jedi masters, and they remain with beings, not just beings on this planet, not just humans and not just Buddhists, but all sentient beings, because their indefatigable dedication is to help all beings evolve and find their own liberation from suffering. Though none of them is omniscient or omnipotent in a quantitative sense, theoretically, a being that becomes self-identified with an infinite relativity should be able to marshal knowledge and competency from other areas and eras of such infinite relativity to bring to bear a virtually absolute accuracy on any particular relational situation, for, situation assisting sentient beings in evolving toward freedom from suffering. This sense of the ultimately overwhelming power of the good guys and the good gals explains the remarkable resilience of Tibetans such as the Dalai Lama, the other developed lamas, and the ordinary Tibetan people living in their aura in the face of the horrendous ordeals they've undergone since being invaded by the Chinese People Liberation Army in 1950, which we could say is, inter is, is invaded by China. But since the Chinese were made into non-China by materialist science, by developing materialist industrial militaristic weapons, by developing industrial militaristic social organization, by developing militaristic spiritually nihilistic uh, ideology, they are being invaded by a resonance, a form resonant with Western colonialism, in fact. And the ordinary Chinese for thousands of years had been more realistically, deeply devoted to the Dharma, in fact, for thousands of years, which people might mistake because many of them are Taoists and Confucians, they would say when asked, but when they died, they were Buddhists. <laughs> they would call Buddhists for the funerals. They would call Buddhists for certain medical conditions. And they would be Taoists when they wanted to be mystical, and they would seek immortality and deny impermanence, that kind of immortality, and they were Confucians at the office when they wanted to raise in the government and the bureaucracy. So they were vulnerable in a way by being open-minded to being brainwashed into this, but obviously not that vulnerable because they, they were able to do revolutions. Although they do, so the revolution against the revolution will be the one where they become really open-minded again. And I think we're seeing that happening, actually. They're just trying to avoid it, some of the hard line, hardcore people. I like we're trying to avoid it here, actually. Everybody's trying to avoid it. The, 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 the bad guys and bad gals who want to dominate people, they want to keep in the dominator style of, 
of, of societies. They don't want true democracy, and they're trying to avoid it in a desperate grip of fascism, gasp at the last gasp of fascism. Well, they do, but we aren't going to deal with it. We're not going to allow it. Although they do not believe in the coherence of the idea of omnipotent God who created the world, controls all things in the world, cares for them, and yet leaves them filled with difficulties for some inscrutable reason, their sense of the infinite relativity of a beginningless and endless universe causes them to side with the probability that, given infinite and beginningless and endless opportunity, infinite numbers of beings must have become relatively more powerful on the side of goodness, joy, love, gentleness, and even fun. Therefore, there is no limit to what goodness, truth, and beauty they can eventually manifest, discover, realize, and create. And this really excellent Buddhaverse is open to be as great as they can make it sooner or later. There is a form of fully awakened Buddha called Time Machine, Kala Chakra, who is ultra esoteric, a manifestation of the Buddhas that demonstrates their unfailing cosmic engagement in the destiny of all sentient beings. It is the most advanced Buddhist theory of history and it is the place where Buddhism becomes most graphically Buddhism. It reveals that under the guidance of the omnicompetent Buddhas, we live in a Buddhaverse already and not a universe, one which becomes one around our ego, but a Buddhaverse that comes around everybody's enlightenment, everybody's selfless Buddhahood. And that Buddhaverse is Pace Voltaire, the best of all possible worlds. It is an ideal evolutionary space-time, ideal for the acceleration of the evolution of all sentient beings toward the supreme form of life, the Buddha life, the life of a being who is all love and all wisdom, finally perfectly ab adapted to absolute relativity by fully identifying with all other beings. Again, this is not a matter requiring religious belief. Rather, it is an invitation to take advantage of the evolutionary opportunity of total open-mindedness. It connects with the prophecy of the and the total open mind. Mind. It connects with the prophecy of the advent of the ideal land of Shambhala or Sambala. An egalitarian, in principle, constitutional monarchy wherein everyone, female and male, old and young, is oriented toward the maximization of meaningful evolution. It is mysteriously hidden from the misknowledge dominated land of struggle, of war, holocaust, plagues, famines, and death ridden subsistence life, but it will emerge in a few centuries in the planetary restoration after the scourges of consumerism and militarism and materialism have run their course. However, there is no need to wait for that to happen. Anyone who discovers the perfection and beauty of this world of evolutionary opportunity, even in the midst of the struggles of today, can turn their steps in this most positive of directions and live the new age from day one. This is the key to the happiness and joy we can implement from within on our own way to becoming Buddhas. Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. And that's the end of this thing. And probably I have only one more thing. Yeah, I do. And uh, which I'll do another time. But uh, what I want to say is that the, when I said in this thing, just to go back to a tiny bit in closing, it is not a matter of requiring religious belief. Rather, it is an invitation to take advantage of the evolutionary opportunity. And what I mean by that is the supreme form of life, the Buddha life, the life of a being who is all love and all wisdom, finally perfectly adapted to absolute relativity by fully identifying with all other beings. <coughs> now, that form of life is inexpressible and unimaginable, of course. That's Buddha is. No even icon can possibly imagine it. However, in the world we are in, of the desire realm we are in, the Kala Chakra 
core divinity is imaginable, and I consider kind of like the supreme work of art, almost. And what it is, is one being as two beings, and that those two beings are a male and a female being, and they are totally into each other, and they are totally simultaneously into all beings through each other, is the way they, are, they do it. And they have a specific iconography, and they look in a specific way to appeal to beings who are in this lesser world and lesser society. And, um, but the, the proof that this is nearby us, I think, has to do with people who are experimenting with transgender things, you know, and with people who are into a highly, who will see finding true eros in life and pleasure in life, younger, youth dimension that wants to, wants that, sees no reason why they can't have that, resents and rebels against the fascist, militaristic, emotional plague-ridden people coming from the last 2,500 years, planetarily actually, get rid of that emotional plague to fully liberate the sensitive, miraculous human machine of joy and beauty and, and bliss. So I do recommend the icon of the Kala Chakra Father Mother. His name is Kala Chakra, which, which means meal, wheel of time. So in a way, as a male, he represents moving in the invisible through the infinity of time. And her name is Vishvamata, and she has no atoms, actually. So in a way, because of not having any kind of coarseness, spatial coarseness in her being, she is already present in all time and symbolizes a return from the infinite of time to, to, be the, to mother all beings into Buddhahood, Vishvamata, and to be the rebirth, their second birth of all beings, and to reconceive them in Buddhahood. In the, in the pattern that they are used to in, in our kind of evolutionary form where we are, you know, genetics and male-female and RNA and DNA and blah, blah, blah. It's really beautiful. So I'm, I'm ending with that vision of the Kala Chakra. And it, therefore, it is significant. So I just want to drop a significant hint that His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in a culture where that very advanced uh, teaching uh, has been preserved since it emerged from Shambhala and touched down in India for a brief time during India's great openness when they were unfortunately vulnerable to domination by lesser cultures, which happened to them. But that's all right. They were able, they were able to tolerate it and deal with it. And they've transformed. They were able to transform these other cultures as well. They will be shown to be that when Shambhala arrives. But anyway, the, the full refinement of that was preserved in Tibet and somewhat in Mongolia as well, when Tibet spread itself through Mongolia, through Central Asia. So it's wonderful, I think. I really, I'm in joy, I'm delighted. So Gewadi and Yodu Dag. So by the virtue of this teaching that we did today, you and me, we both did it. You know, even though I'm talking and I'm reading the book, if you're listening to it and trying to stay mindful and lucidly listening, which means trying not to be mentally distracted as you listen, thinking about breakfast or tomorrow or some minor side issue, which is your one-pointedness, it's your samadhi while you're awake and while you're, you're, so your vipassana is also going by listening. So both are going together already. And by the, you, because you, you have samadhi, all of you have one-pointedness. Everybody does. Uh. So we all did it together. And when I say I'm grateful to you for listening to this, giving me the excuse, which then gives me people feeling that I should read it, actually, as well. I already did make an audible out of it, but not with time to flip myself out and correct myself here and there and learn more as I am when reading this, which is especially fun for me. So... Uh, I am thankful to you, and I mean it when I say I invest the merit of doing this into becoming as Buddha, a Buddha, a Manjushri, 
as quickly as possible, a subtle plain Buddha mandatory as quickly as possible, to be able to help you become Buddhas, just same as me, as quickly as possible. So then you can talk. <laughs> I don't have to talk. Because you're completely at home in clear light, magic body, beauty, and bliss. And there's no, we don't have any five, five, five alarm fires to rush to, and, and disasters, and famines, and plagues, and earthquakes. And Mother Earth is happy because she's not being abused. Everything is going really great. And there are many other Mother Earths and many other planets and beings. We will join the, join the endless Buddhaverse vision of, of joyous, brilliant, all good, Samantabhadra life force, universal, Buddhaversal life force. OK? Okay, so we'll try to do tomorrow. Yes. Hey. And if we have the same time, yes. approximately, um, I might, I think, because I, I will finish fairly quickly. I'll finish, finish it. Oh, it's easy. It's uh, chapter 10, my consolation prize. And it's not very long, but I might flip out too and take. Uh, I don't think, I, although I, even if I flip out, it won't go, It won't be more. It won't be two hours. I don't think so. So I'm going to bring the Lotus Sutra. Excellent. And I'm going to start. I'm going to do a little something on the Lotus Sutra. What page? Just experimental. What page? 181. Om Avaja Guru Vakinda Manjushi Vakinda Sum Pataraka Sumati Vajadara. No, <laughs> I'm completely gaga now. Om Guru Vakinda Manjushi Vakinda Pataraka Sumati Nyana Shasana Dara Samudra Sri Bhatta Zara Siddhi Om Om Buddha Om Guru Vajadara Manjushi Vakindra Bhattaraka Sumati Jnana Vajrasya Sanadara Samudra Sri Bhattasavasadehum Pat Om